Welcome to Convocation today. I'm really excited to be able to introduce our speaker. I need to tell you a little bit about how I learned about our speaker today. About, golly, how long ago? Maybe 15, 16 months ago, I had uh, Bonnie Baxter, Dr. Bon Bonnie Baxter from Westminster College, who came here to Snow College and talked about Great Salt Lake. And after her presentation, we were having lunch, and she talked about uh, the SALT initiative, which really intrigued me. And so she was able to put me into contact with our speaker today. Um, and we started chatting a little bit via email. And um, I'm just really excited that he has agreed to come and talk about this collaboration between scientists and artists. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Matt. His studio practice interrogates the relationships created between our conceptions of nature and landscape through imagery based on slow observation and analytic tr analytical trans translation with an awareness of how technological mediation influences the depiction of forms and spaces. He exhibits his work internationally in juried solo, group, and invitational exhibitions, including Converge, and Tenebris in Reykjavik, Iceland, drawing discourse at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, and Prima Facie and statewide annual exhibitions in Salt Lake City, Utah. In fact, in late 2016, he was artist in residence in Reykjavik, Iceland. He earned his MFA in painting and drawing from Arizona State University and his BFA in painting at Colorado State University. I also just learned that he is an animal lover and he uh, takes care of foster cats. Is that right? So please welcome to the stage our speaker, Matt Kruback. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for that introduction. Thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is uh, Matt Kruback. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a couple uh, cool projects or a couple facets of a really cool project that I got to work on. Um, I am not a public speaker. I do not enjoy being up here. So like perhaps a few of you, um, when you speak in public, I am unbelievably nervous. So apologies if I get lost in my own notes here. Um, so yeah, um, great introduction. So I'm a, a professor of painting and drawing at Westminster College. Um, I um, have been in Utah for, uh, this is the end of my 14th year. I arrived in 2009. Um, grew up in Colorado, um, spent a lot of time out here in Utah as a kid, um, you know, Red Rocks and um, the Southwest, all that good stuff. Um, I, uh, I have six cats. Um, I'm what you call a foster fail. Um, we were uh, intending to find homes for them, and in fact, they found a home in my home, so um, I have a lot of cats. Um, but we also foster dogs, and I'm just an animal person in general. Um, so yeah, let me talk a little bit about this project. So um, I really like problem solving. I like uh, making things. I'm a stuff maker. Um, I'm an artist, so I make paintings, I make drawings, I'm interested in technology. Um, I, I like to stay busy. I like to have something to put my mind to for better or for worse. Um, and so that, that whole idea of making things fits really well with being an artist, because as artists we make things. We make pictures, we make sculptures, photographs, whatever it might be. And so that idea of making has become a big part of who I am and, and actually how I teach, too. I like to talk about making art is we're just making things and we're talking about those things that we make. Um, and that's, I think, partially why I ended up in, in academia and teaching, because I liked working with other people to make stuff. Um, making things is really cool. Making things sometimes fails. Um, making things sometimes succeeds. And um, in both of those things, there's a lot of fun. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the beginning of this project. So it, um, it kind of built 
from things that were already happening, um, things that I was already doing, things that, that naturally just occurred in, in the process of every day for me. Um, in the studio, I'm incredibly active. I don't like sitting and lecturing. I'm, I'm a mover. You can see I'm kind of like fidgety and moving around the podium right now. Um, the idea of being in one place and talking um, for an extended period of time doesn't fit really how I learned and how I felt other people might, might learn best. So um, I like to keep things active. I'm a studio teacher, so I teach painting and drawing. Um, it's a very active thing. We're moving around, we're standing. And that actually translated into some of the things I was doing with my beginning drawing class. Um, we had a brand new building, the Meldrum Science Building, and this building was absolutely perfect for teaching linear perspective. Have any of you taken a drawing course and, and studied linear perspective? So you're looking at converging lines, you're talking about you know, what we see when we look at architecture and things like that. And our studio space was really underwhelming. There wasn't a whole lot going on there. And so I thought, well, we've got this really beautiful space. It had just been completed, I think, in 2010, the year after I arrived. And so I would take all my drawing students over there with our rulers and we would look at linear perspective. Um, it's about three or four floors. Um, you can look up through this main atrium. There's these really great converging lines, lots of perpendicular and parallel lines. It's perfect for seeing perspective. And so I spent a lot of time over in the science building. Um, I uh, happened upon a lot of my colleagues over there, so I would meet people from biology, people from anatomy, people from chemistry, from physics. And we'd have those sort of you know, awkward hallway conversations about, oh, hi, who are you, I, uh, so and so. Oh, I'm into art, oh, cool, I like art. But those conversations would also evolve into discussions about, well, what is linear perspective? Well, linear perspective is what happens when a lens-based system translates photons from the world into the back of our retinas, right? So physically parallel lines don't actually converge, but they look like they're converging. You've probably all stood on a set of train tracks and they look like they're coming together towards the horizon. They're not thankfully doing that, but it optically appears that way. And so these conversations started about, well, we're doing this thing in drawing, how does that relate to physics? Well, it's about the lens-based system of how you're seeing things. And so those got me excited as somebody who's interested in intersections and cool things and sort of kicked off one part of that project. Occasionally, we would have conversations about particular students because as faculty, we definitely talk about all of you, whether you want us to or not. We talk about cool things that you're doing, we talk about things you might be interested in, um, as a way of fostering some of these cool connections. And one student that actually came up in a couple conversations was Arlie Landry. Arlie was a student who was really interested in biology, really liked bio, um, liked taking biology classes, but was also equally interested in art. And she was really frustrated that no sort of clear career or academic track incorporated both of those. She wanted to be uh, uh, an illustrator. She wanted to be a scientific illustrator. And um, in looking at some of those programs, they're kind of few and far between. There are a few graduate programs and certificates in scientific illustration, but there are only maybe a handful of these undergraduate um, programs in the United States specifically for scientific illustration. So we took advantage of a customized major program that we have and we created a customized major for early that incorporated some bio classes, some drawing classes, and got her situated in between these two disciplines so she could actually go on and do this thing that she wanted to do. After that, we started thinking about more ways to do kind of creative, innovative things. And this scientific illustration workshop actually was um, built around this career path that Arlie was interested in. So I contacted an old friend of mine from graduate school who was a scientific illustrator and he was an artist back in the day, or maybe he's still an artist, I don't exactly know right now. Um, but he was doing scientific illustration for these paleontological studies. And so I brought him in for a two-day workshop. We um, talked about hand-drawn traditional illustrations. We talked about photography. We talked about different ways of imaging science so that um, right, ideas could be communicated. Right? When we're documenting something, we're trying to communicate a particular idea with as little interpretation and wiggle room as possible. 
which I guess could be a debate if that's actually possible. But this was really fun. It was a two-day um, workshop. I think we did it in 2014 and 2015. Um, had a lot of fun. Um, we got to draw from specimens. We got um, the cadavers from our anatomy lab and did some drawing from those. Um, my, my friend Brent talked about his research. Um, and we just spent a couple days drawing things, talking about illustration. It was a ton of fun. Shortly after this, my colleagues in biology um, encountered an artist named Moto Yamamoto. And Moto Yamamoto is an installation drawing artist who's interested in natural materials and particularly salt. So this is a, an image here on the left of Motoy actually installing one of these labyrinths. Um, he, he essentially draws with salt. He's developed this really interesting method of taking a container of salt and with his finger, um, kind of releasing the salt so he can pour it in these beautiful labyrinth kind of patterns. Um, and if you look him up, he's got all these different installations that he's done that are this labyrinth pattern, some that look like natural confluences of rivers and things. Um, but the most impressive part of this is he literally sits on this mat for probably five or six days, eight hours a day, just pouring salt over and over and over and over again. I don't know how he doesn't have back problems, but maybe he does. So it was an interesting hybrid of bringing an artist in who had some sort of a connection to science to actually do some art in this science space and bring us all together. And one more interesting thing to, um, to share with you all before I kind of move on is this program that we have for first year students. It's called Learning Communities. Um, I'm not sure if you have them here, but um, at Westminster, uh, where I teach, um, incoming first year students are enrolled in two courses together. So it's the same cohort of students in one class as it is the other. And the faculty who teach that course are charged with trying to come up with interesting connections between them. So uh, as an art professor, I always taught a beginning drawing course. And when I was paired with different um, folks, um, it kind of jumped disciplines. So I've worked with a biologist. I've worked with um, somebody in the business department. I worked with an English um, professor to create these learning communities where the content of each course is firmly rooted in the discipline that it exists in. So mine was all drawing, all visual art, and my colleagues were in their, their particular discipline. But what was interesting is they asked us to try and come up with common assignments that would at least get us looking at each other across those disciplinary walls, what we call these silos of, of um, academia, right? When you're an artist, you do only art, and that's all you do. Um, and that's not at all what I do, right? I do so many different things with my art. Um, and scientists are interested in so many additional things beyond just the science that they teach. So it's a great opportunity for people like me who like to wander out of their lane a little bit, wander into somebody else's lane and, and ask them questions about what they do and find connections. So this is an image of a learning community. Um, we also do kind of hands-on experiential things. We took them uh, camping at the San Rafael Swell for a couple nights. We did some um, illustrations of organisms there. We did studies of um, some of the um, evolutionary pressures um, on these organisms. So right, heat does certain things to, to plants that keep them a certain way, and obviously animals, right? I'm clearly Northern European, so I don't do well in the heat. Um, Right? So, so looking at organisms and trying to understand how their physical appearance through so slow observation shows us what those evolutionary pressures might be was one of those interesting connections that we talked about and we looked at. And it was a fun chance to get out in the desert, get dirty, and eat giant sandwiches out of a cooler, which is always a lot of fun. Okay, so... Um, after several years of kind of doing things um, around each other and, and towards each other, um, Bonnie Baxter, my colleague um, that was mentioned, uh, came up with this idea and said, well, what, what if we actually formalize some of these things we were doing, not just these little bits and pieces here and there, but what if we actually submitted a grant, what if we got some money, what if we pulled some people together, pulled some students together, and created a program that was intentionally doing a lot of these things in a specific way. And that's what leads to SALT, scientists and artists learning together, 
we wrote a grant to the Keck Foundation. The Keck Foundation is a group that um, funds undergraduate um, innovative projects. They fund research. They fund all sorts of things. Um, but typically, it's wherever students are involved. So they want to get students um, engaged in these things. They want students to do this stuff. Um, and our program, as it was outlined, had these three components to it. So the first was interdisciplinary undergraduate curriculum. So the learning communities, um, courses that we had in the back of our mind, the sort of idealized, like, I'd love to teach this class with you kind of thing. Um, those things were on the back burner. Um, undergraduate summer research, Westminster has a pretty robust undergraduate summer research program. So over the, the two and a half-ish months of summer, we actually have some funding to um, pair a student with a faculty member or faculty members to do research in a particular area that they find interesting. Um, they don't get credit for it, but they do get paid for it, which is really nice. Um, and that's something that can go on their resume. If you're going into um, you know, medicine or um, things like that. They want to see that you've been active, that you're doing that kind of research. And the last element was community engagement. So we're, we are really good at Westminster at doing amazing, cool things on campus and letting nobody else know about it. Right? I've done so many cool things in my classrooms and studios, and I'm literally the only person who knows about it other than my students. And so what we wanted to do with this third component was get out into the community. How do we take some of these cool things that we're doing, not only to support Westminster students, but get out to um, you know, K through 12 students, um, high school teachers, people up at the Utah Museum of Natural History. We want to take something really cool and share it with other people. And that's SALT. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, the undergraduate curriculum that we developed. So this is um, that same learning community. Um, this image on the left here is our giant sandwich banquet table. Um, we had a group of probably about 13 or 14 students and two faculty. We also had a couple folks who um, helped us with this. But we planned all sorts of events that um, tried to explore that intersection between these two disciplines. So I talked a little bit about this, um, this adventure to the San Rafael Swell. But um, we also took some trips locally. There's a little river that runs through our campus and we spent some time down there. Um, we went to some other wild places around. The teaching partner that I worked with is a herpetologist. Is that a reptile person? Did I get it? Awesome. OK, cool. Um, so yeah, so he's really interested in lizards. And so he would go out and show us how to catch things. Um, and, and I would take photos and draw and uh, try not to touch things that, that might want to attack me. Um, but this is an example, uh, some images of us on this um, field trip. It was amazing and fun, and we went hiking, um, and we got super dirty and um, lived amongst the scorpions for a little while. Uh, at the end of the semester, um, we'd spent all this time talking about beginning drawing, right? So in, be in a beginning drawing class, you talk about the basics of drawing, value, line, composition, um, repetition, all the basics of, of design. And we kept making these drawings over the course of the semester, some from observation, some from invention, wanted to see what would happen if we tried to draw something as faithfully as possible from life and what that would communicate to somebody else. Like, would somebody be able to tell what species the organism was? Would they be able to tell what state of bloom it was in? Would they maybe be able to tell where this organism was found? Um, and then we started playing a little bit with that. So as you all know, art, art and science are different. Um, and so we started to look at well, if we study the evolutionary pressures of these organisms, right, heat being one thing, right, if there's a lot of heat, it's going to do something to the way organisms evolve. What if we take those stressors and envision what might happen to that organism over the course of 10,000 years, 100,000 years, a million years, right? And so we got to play fantasy a little bit and do some things that, you know, maybe are tangentially related to science, but are definitely more in uh, the arts. And so these uh, illustrations that you're seeing here are a combination of very faithful um, two-life illustrations of organisms and then some um, that we had projected millions of years into the future that um, because of rising CO2 levels and, and increasing heat, they were now glowing at night to communicate and reproduce and things like that. And we created this big installation wall. Um, actually, there's another side to this too on just behind where the camera is. Um, and we literally covered these walls with... Um, beautiful drawings, illustrations, all sorts of work that they'd done over the semester. 
We also took a trip up to the Utah Museum of Natural History. So again, thinking about this connection between science and how science is visualized, or the art of science, um, we met with the very, very tiny individual on the left there, Tim Lee, who's the, um, I believe he's the exhibitions designer head. Um, and so he's in charge of the way that all the science looks in this place. And he actually is somebody who we, <laughs> I, I want to say collaborated with, but also kind of took advantage of um, over the course of this project because he was really willing to come in and work with students a lot and talk to them about what he does, give feedback on the designs that they were doing, um, and he's just an all-around great guy. If, if you ever get up to the Museum of Natural History, see if Tim Lee is there and, and tell him that Matt sent you. Or maybe don't. Maybe don't tell him that I sent you. Just say you heard good things about him. I think I, think I owe him a gift. Um, but this is us standing in the center of, of the Museum of Natural History. We're in this, um, this sort of big, I think they call it the, the Great Hall, and they've got these displays of artifacts and fossils and things, and then a big map of Utah um, in the center there. And we had a ton of fun with this class. I think we actually taught this class three or four times, this learning community. Um, always, always really, really interesting projects that came out of that. Okay, uh, so another class. So um, this is a different model um, of teaching. So uh, we built this class, the Art and Science of Creativity, around what's called a co-teaching model, which is where you have two faculty in the classroom at the same time. Um, team teaching is a model where you technically might have two faculty, but you're really only seeing one at a time, right? They sort of, they do it as a team. Co-teaching is a lot of fun because I get to be a student while my co-teacher is teaching, um, and then she gets to become a student when I do teaching. And we're trying to equally share the responsibilities of the class that we've created. So this is a course that we, uh, we created for our W Core, which is the general education core. I'm sure you all have something like that here where you take an English course and maybe an arts course, things like that, right? Your generals. Um, we call ours the W Core, and this was a course that we created to literally look at the art and science of creativity. So we wanted to, again, position students with the idea that we're not going to be looking only at one or the other, but we wanna get into that middle space and, and get lost a little bit. One of the first things we told our students was, you're gonna feel really uncomfortable, and we're gonna feel uncomfortable because we won't know really what we're doing or what we're talking about, because I'm not a scientist, I'm an amateur scientist, um, my colleague is not an artist, um, although she is taking a drawing class right now, um, and she has done some work illustrating. They used to, with a little stippling pen, they used to actually illustrate what they were seeing under the microscope. So we were really coming from a similar place where we were trying to make these connections um, and walk into that, that unknown space, trying to figure out how do we make sense of what happens in between here. So in this slide, you can see on the left, um, these are students who are learning how to do gel electrophoresis. Um, and it's been a while since I've learned that, so if you all know what that is, great. Um, essentially, you are breaking up DNA in a way and running current through it so that the chunks of the DNA separate at different points. Um, it would be like dropping, I think, different sized stones into a river, right? The light ones would move faster and would head down the river. The heavier ones would kind of remain up at the top. And that's how you get those DNA um, sequences. I've got a, an image of it here in the center, here, right? You've all seen that on probably one of the true crime shows that, that are popular right now, something like that, right? So we're actually learning that process here in Bonnie's lab. Um, practicing that, thinking about what that means, talking about how it shows us something um, factual and scientific, but there's also ambiguity to it. And on the right here, um, literally a day later, we're in the drawing studio, and this is for some reason the pose that I strike in every photo, leaning over looking at somebody's work, um, to work with watercolor, to think about, well, how does watercolor react in that same way? Different pigments have different weights, and when you flood a piece of paper with water, those pigments are gonna react differently, right? The heavier ones are gonna wanna stay put, the lighter ones are gonna wanna move away. Same basic idea, very, very different outcomes. And this is a collection of images, um, that gel electrophoresis plate in the center there, and then two experimental watercolors that you can see kind of reflect what the visuals of that look like. Uh, 
Um, do you all have a, a class that's like a four week, like a May term course or a January course? Okay, awesome, thank you. <laughs> I thought I looked up and I thought I saw something like that, but um, we also have something, we call it Matrum, and it's essentially four weeks after the end of our spring semester where um, in my head I call it, I like to do fun stuff that I can't do in a normal class semester. Um, so we do little projects that are super interesting to us, but might not fit within the context of a full semester. So this May, I'm teaching a, a course on mono printing um, and a plein air landscape painting class. Two things that I can't really do in a full semester, but that I really enjoy, that I've done actually quite a bit. This is a class that we developed um, in the SALT program to take advantage of that four week course. And it brought together our ceramics professor and a chemist to talk about and be scientific with glaze chemistry. So um, what, what happens when you fire a particular glaze? How does it look on the ceramic body when you modify temperatures in a scientific way, right? When you bump the temperature, the firing temperature up five degrees, what does that glaze do? What change happens? Um, and so looking at the aesthetic, interesting art side of things along with being scientific, being you know, meticulous with keeping records and seeing how that changes what happens in that class. And this is a trio of images of our ceramics professor on the left, our chemist in the middle, and on the right, uh, an empty kiln with something that ceramicists use. I don't know what those are, but maybe spacers. I don't know. The image looks cool, though. Okay, um, and one more Matrim course. So uh, Bonnie and I really enjoyed working together, and we wanted to do that again, and we thought, well, one thing that we really haven't touched on, and this is where Tim Lee comes back into the picture, is how do we actually talk about visualizing science? How do we and how do others create images and visuals that communicate something that we could call truth, right? Science is about fact, with maybe a little asterisk after that, right? It's about truth, it's about trying to understand the way the world works. The visual language is not necessarily about that. Art really isn't about that in its entirety, right? Art is kind of sometimes about telling you a lie so that you realize the truth, which we found to be an interesting proposition for this class, what we call science and the visual language. This class was devoted to thinking about a scientific idea and communicating that idea through visuals. And we took advantage of this uh, new lab that we had um, just been granted, and you can see an image on the right there. Um, we call our Maker Lab. The, um, there's a, a very, very generous family who donated um, some money for us to add digital drawing, some 3D modeling, um, 3D printing um, facets to our art department. And so we took advantage of all that hardware and, and that um, the, the new lab smell, as I call it, to kick off this science and the visual language class. And what we did, we brought back Tim Lee, so there's Tim again, normal size this time, um, and we asked Tim to give us feedback on an exhibit design. So in our Meldrum Science Building, we have these little alcove spaces where they have demonstrations of science. So you've probably all seen them, right? You grab the thing and move it, and it shows you science. Um, well, that's kind of what Tim does, and that's what we wanted to do in one of these empty spaces was uh, pay tribute to the individual, the namesake of the Meldrum Science Building, Pete Meldrum, and create a display on the fundamental science that he built his company on. So Myriad Genetics is a big genetics corporation, and one of their key discoveries was um, a test to, to look for a particular gene. It's, it's I'm remembering, oh. I have anxiety brain, so it's not gonna come to me, BRCA. There's a BRCA gene test, and it tests for, for um, the potential for someone to develop breast cancer. And it's amazing for helping in early detection. Um, if you discover that you do have this gene, right, you can take preventative measures um, in order to you know, be, be prepared in whatever way that, that you're going to um, if you do eventually develop breast cancer. So this test was huge. And what we challenged our, our students to do after some fun activities where um, we asked them not to talk to each other but to communicate things, 
we wanted them to design a display that would show how this BRCA gene functions, right? um, how it's detected. And so in the left image here, you can see a student kind of describing in this maquette space that we had developed how he was planning on showing this science in that particular space. And on the right here, there's a student showing a 3D model uh, to Tim that, that she was building um, that would ultimately become, I might have a slide of this, I think. Yeah, it would become a, this, this sort of VR space. So we used, um, this is my colleague Bonnie on the left. I snapped this photo when, when she wasn't, well, couldn't look. Um, but she's in this sort of virtual reality space with, I think it's a Quest headset. And then on the right we have um, that same student who's actually building and uh, walking through her exhibition in VR on the right there. And that was a lot of fun. We created very sort of silly models and painted them. And um, we all got to take turns with this helmet and walk around and walk through stuff. OK. Um, another part of this is the undergraduate summer research. So Westminster has a, a really developed undergraduate research uh, program, as I talked about. And we wanted to take advantage of that, specifically in a SALT context where we were getting students um, involved with both science and art faculty and getting faculty involved with each other. Um, a lot of faculty really like to stay in their own spot, right? Just like the rest of us, right? I, I, don't always go out of my way to engage other people in their disciplines. We wanted to, you could say invite, you could also say force faculty to go talk to other faculty. Um, and they were all great, they were fabulous. It was a little bit awkward at first, but we wanted to get people in the same room to have these conversations that I had been having with Bonnie and Bonnie had been having with, with um, some of her colleagues and actually formalize this into a research program. So pay students to come in and do really cool research, interdisciplinary research, and then get those projects out into the community, um, exhibit them, um, get papers published, all sorts of things. And so I've got a few slides of some interesting projects here that I will kind of go through a little bit more quickly. This is an exhibition space that we had in the basement of the Meldrum Science Center. And we tried to have uh, a sort of culminating gallery um, exhibition at the end of all of this. So after the summer session was done, we would get um, all the works collected, put them up on the walls, we'd have a little reception, um, and they would stay up for I th about six months, nine months, so that people could see what we were doing. And in this image you can see on the left here, that's called a, a bathymetric map. And again, apologies if I'm not saying that right or misremembering it, but it's, um, it's kind of like a topographical map for water. It sort of measures the depths of where um, different shelves and things are. So this is a, a bathymetric map of the Great Salt Lake, um, looking at how, how actually shallow the lake really is. Um, to the right of that, there is some landscape photography. I don't remember what student that was, but um, some more aesthetic um, images that were kind of looking at weather patterns. Um, we also have a big field of um, study around uh, pelicans. So there's a big migratory pelican um, colony that, that arrives every spring. Um, and we sort of use them as a measure of how healthy the lake is doing, right? If there's more water, there's more food, there are more pelicans. If there's less water, there's less food strikingly fewer pelicans, right? So it kind of makes sense to look at these things as a natural indicator of how that particular health of that, that body of water is. Um, that central piece here is a, a student named Ashley who was really interested in bee colony collapse, if you've ever heard of that, um, right? Western uh, bees and honeybees are um, very, very fragile creatures, right? A, a subtle shift in temperatures um, and entire colony, series of colonies will actually um, meet their demise. And so she was interested in how we could better support um, colonies of bees in the architecture that we're building, right? So she looked into different ways of creating, um, you've all seen beehives in, in you know, fields or maybe in somebody's backyards, but actually, um, right, honeybees are one of only a series of bees that, that really need help, that need our support. And so she was looking at, um, I believe they're called paper, paper cutting bees, or they do something with paper, they chew wood and they make a paper substance. Um, but anyway, supporting them by creating these little niches for them to create homes in. They sort of lay their, their young or their eggs into a little thing and then they cover it over and then they, they go off and do their own thing. So she was looking at how could you create structural architectural elements um, with these spaces so that these little creatures would have a place to live. 
We also did a, a couple projects up at the tar seeps on the, the sort of north east end of the lake, there's this naturally occurring tar that happens. There was some petroleum exploration out there, I think back in the 50s and 60s. Turned out not to be much up there. And um, so now it's just kind of a, a creepy place where people go to explore and, and maybe party and also see the things that get stuck in the tar, like the tar pits if you've ever been to uh, Los Angeles. And so we had a bunch of students go up and, and kind of explore what happened in this place, um, what, what were some of the things that they noticed. Um, they're all active, and so there's this bizarre sticky black tar kind of just bubbling up and, and um, covering the, the salt up there. Um, and she created a piece um, called Crude 1968. Um, and this is a mixed media work that um, is kind of half painting, half burlap textile work, half dead things sewn into the fabric. Um, it smelled really interesting. Um, this is that, that student that we saw earlier actually installing these ceramic pieces. Um, she created um, this journal, this meticulous journal of um, the temperatures, the kind of glaze, the amount of time in the, in the kiln, and then created these really interesting visual installations that, that showed how that change materialized on each piece. I mentioned the uh, 3D modeling and the 3D printing space that we had. We had a bunch of students who were interested in 3D modeling uh, brine shrimp. And so this is actually a student named June who put together this amazing brine shrimp model. And we printed it in a couple different contexts. Um, if you've ever been to Antelope Island on the Great Salt Lake, they actually use these printed models now in an educational sense. Um, they've got these, these big ones and these medium-sized ones. Um, and it's really fun to see what these really sci-fi looking creatures look like when they're enlarged. I don't want to encounter that in a cold basement. But they're so tiny, so they're actually really cute. Um, we had some dancers who were interested in exploring the lake. So a um, student named uh, Caitlin Killian actually took some, uh, some of her fellow dancers up, and they composed some pieces up on the lake in response to um, Pelicans, birds, um, the bird population up there is, is you know, like I mentioned with the pelicans, something that we really keep our eye on. Um, and use that as inspiration to sort of dance what these population numbers were looking like, right? In a, a very different sense than just a graph or a, a chart filled with numbers. There's a couple images of the dancers. If you've ever been to the Salt Lake Fringe Festival, you've probably seen a work or two that was workshopped um, through the SALT program. So um, Great Salt Lake Fringe Festival is a sort of, maybe call it counterculture um, theater event where um, space is kind of available and a lot of people get to workshop new and challenging things. And we had a, a few students who worked with our theater faculty to actually create some work that was situated and based on some of the lake science. Andrew did some photography of these locations where, where some of our faculty and students were doing research, um, documenting water levels. Um, the, the lake is so shallow that the water can actually progress and recede um, 40, 50 feet in a day. Haven't you been to the Great Salt Lake? Presumably a few of you have, right? It smells amazing. Um, but it's really interesting because it is so shallow, you see these incredibly marked moves in the shoreline. Um, there's a couple uh, works of art up there, the Spiral Jetty, if any of you've heard of that, um, that used to be covered in water, and now the water, I think, is like a mile and a half away from it. Um, but anyway, documentation um, through an aesthetic lens of the particular lakeshore. A couple students formed the Great Salt Lake podcast to talk about um, Great Salt Lake issues. Um, you've probably been hearing on the news or, or in one of your social media feeds about the dire situation that the lake is in. Um, we, we need water, and I know that we're getting a lot of water, but um, the, the lake bed actually has all sorts of toxins in it, and we need that water to keep it saturated and hydrated so it doesn't blow into the air and come into the city. And so a lot of these um, podcasts they were doing were talking about what are some of the, the detrimental effects of um, you know, overwatering. I have a giant lawn in my yard that I can't wait to, to minimize. I'm wasting a lot of water on it. Um, that could be going into the Great Salt Lake. Um, mining exists along the shoreline extraction, right? Salt, uh, Morton Salt gets a lot of their, their road salt and softener salt literally from the lake. So they're pulling water out, evaporating it, and then taking the salt. 
couple students did a, a storm drain mural on projects to remind folks that um, th those drains actually lead somewhere, right? It's not just, um, not just a portal to nowhere and to be mindful of what they're putting down those drains. And Winogradsky columns are a huge hit. Winogradsky columns are super fun. You'll see those come back in just a second here. But essentially, you create a sealed environment with um, whatever you've collected from the lake, and uh, it grows its own little environment here without oxygen. So the, the algae creates oxygen, and the bugs feed off of that, and they feed off of other things, but you leave them, and they just grow and grow and grow. Okay, um, so the last part of this was community engagement. So I'll, I'll go a little bit quicker through this because my time is ticking and I have too much to share. Um, Brandon Ballinger is an artist uh, scientist who is really interested in, in intersections of art and science. And he, uh, we contacted him to come do a little bit of an artist presentation, which involved building one of these sculptures that he creates. And on the inside of this sculpture, on the left there, you can see the CAD model that we designed. On the right side, you can see the actual sculpture. There are all these um, infrared lights, those blue infrared light. Bugs love infrared light. If you've ever seen a bug zapper outside of a, a bar or a restaurant or even in a restaurant, that light attracts bugs. And ultimately, with those zappers, they, they, they bite the dust. With this, they just come towards that cloth, and then we can collect them and study them, um, and then release them you know, from whence they came. Um, so we created these really cool sculptures. Um, Brandon came out. He did a couple days of um, discussions and presentations. We took these up to the Utah Museum of Natural History for an event that they call Bug Fest, um, which is a citizen science program to get people involved in collecting bugs, thinking about um, insects um, in a scientific way. And here I am, again, bent over looking at somebody's project very interestingly. Um, so one of the last couple things that I'll mention, so Arlie um, continued to work with us throughout this project. She had long since graduated, um, but one of the final projects that she got to work on and illustrate was this um, Great Salt Lake uh, monster mystery book, um, which uh, is kind of um, a nice bow on this project because she got to um, illustrate something um, finally in, in a professional sense, and she's gone on to do all sorts of other great things. Um, we also put together a, um, an exhibition at the Utah Museum of Fine Art called Confluence. Um, it was about the uh, science health, or, I'm sorry, the, uh, the lake health and science, and there are more Winogradsky columns. Okay, ah, I am done. Um, so takeaways, so the, the thing that I really liked about this project is, is a lot of the same stuff that I like about why I teach, why I teach art. Um, feed your curiosity with cool stuff. I like to stay inspired. I like to feed my curiosity. I think that's why maybe all of you are here, or at least in a particular class that you're taking, because you've got that curiosity in you. And this program was all about building opportunities for that curiosity to be nurtured. Um, we made a lot of stuff, too, right? So my, my feedback for students in my classes is make as much as you possibly can. Don't worry if it's great, don't worry if it's terrible. Make a lot of stuff and then sort through it when you're done. Reflect when you're over. That stuff you make will lead to more stuff, right? Every work I make has the genetic material of the thing that I'm about to make in my studio. And the thing that I really, really want to communicate through this project is find really curious people who want to do cool stuff with you. Um, having a, a network, having a group of like-minded people in the same room, even just to talk about something silly, gives you that fuel to make things, to be curious, to see what comes next. Okay, I'm in my thank you page. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Snow College. Thank you all for coming on a Thursday. Um, I know that Thursday is almost Friday, which means it's almost the weekend. Um, I guess that's why I'm looking at it. I have meetings tomorrow, but you're close to the weekend. Um, my colleagues at Westminster, thank you, Bonnie, Jamie, David, um, the Great Salt Lake Institute. Thank you, Keck Foundation, for giving us money to do amazing, interesting, and wild things. And absolutely, my students who inspire me to be better, do better, and make cool stuff with them. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for a few questions. Would anybody like to ask a question? Yeah.
Look at all this stage out here that I never got to. So what is your biggest piece of advice for people who are like wanting to go out and do community work and just kind of getting their work known? I would say talk to your community. Be a good listener of the people that you are um, working with and bringing things to. Um, that, that's something that is incredibly important. Um, not only, there, there's, I'm, I'm very selfish. I'm an artist. I like to make things in my studio that sort of exist and stay in my studio. I think a lot of artists do that, right? We think about exhibitions and where the thing is going to go kind of as an afterthought, but the thing that I'm interested in is what I'm doing in my studio at the time. That community aspect is so important, though, because if you are intentionally working with the community, you need to hear what they need, what they want, what their feedback is. And so being a good member of that community, I think, is really important. Being a great listener um, of, of um, whatever community that you're working with, um, enthusiasm helps a ton. Um, working with the community can be challenging um, in a lot of ways, but it's, you know, in a lot, in in every sense of the, the word, the best work that you can do, right, to serve others. Um, so yeah, enthusiasm, uh, be a good listener, um, and welcome collaboration. I think that's something, right, you've all worked on a group project that maybe hasn't been the, the best. Um, I hated group projects when I was in college, when I was in high school. Um, I've learned to like them. Um, I've learned that, that working with others can be really rewarding, despite how challenging it can be. And I, I use that maybe as a model for that community question is, you know, pay attention to the people that you're working with and for, um, and, and utilize them as, as a, a pillar of what you're doing. Yeah, does that answer your question maybe? That was a little rambling, but. Um. I have a question. Um, so you've worked, so I, I think you said that the Keck uh, grant is, has gone away now. You've, you've used it all up. So, mm -hmm. so that was for scientists and artists. Is there another group that you would like to work with next? Ooh, oh boy. That's a great question. Um, I'd love to go back and do more work with the science folks. Um, one of my learning communities was, um, and, and this was a, I think we did it once, um, and then for, for one reason or another it, it sort of folded, but I actually got to do some work with a, a, a business faculty on um, adaptive design. So I teach a class called Maker Lab, and we talk about 3D modeling, 3D printing, um, and design-based thinking, right, which, is, which has a lot of corollaries to visual art, right? We prototype, we think about what works, what doesn't work, and then we iterate, things like that. Um, and that was actually really, really fun because it engaged a functional side of what I'm interested in, um, in making things and designing. And I'm a, I'm a very amateur woodworker. I build frames for my work. And so um, I like the idea of manufacturing devices, like things that actually help adapt spaces to um, people who have special needs, right? If you are um, in a wheelchair, right, you, you can't use a kitchen in the same way that somebody who's not in a wheelchair does, right? So things have to be lowered, things have to be managed for safety reasons, things like that. Um, and so that was actually a really, um, that was something that piqued my interest and then died out as soon as it had done that. So um, I really like, I would love to do more of that, I think. Um, I'm also interested in working with um, some of my arts colleagues. So we have um, a music department, a theater department um, up on Westminster's campus, and I'd, I'd like to see what projects develop when we just sort of chat in a room as well, um, because they're, they're more related, but still there's a big gap between visual art and music, um, and that would be a fun one to explore. Dance, I'm not a dancer, I'm, I'm not a dancer at all, um, but I do like movement, I do like watching people dance and thinking about dance. Any other questions? Yeah. Oops. Sorry, I, I told it, I kind of took over the person pointing here. So I have a quick question. You mentioned how you do a lot of group work with students out in the field and stuff. Mm -hmm. Are you only accepting students from Westminster, or can we come online and? join and then come and join you guys when you do these So projects. this program was for enrolled students. Um, we, we try to do as much like community type work, I think maybe like, like you're talking about. Um, what I would say is if you're interested, this is, this is something that I'm not particularly good at, if you're interested in doing cool stuff, 
um, share your name, get in touch with people like me, like Bonnie, and just say, hey, if you're ever doing something, I'd be really interested in joining you. Um, right? Obviously, you know, if it's a class or something, that, that's you know, limited for students who are enrolled, but um, we do all sorts of things where we have a group going out to the Salt Lake to do science or we're doing an activity. Um, social media is a thing that you all are really good at. Um, follow Westminster's Instagram page um, and you'll see some of the things that, that we're doing there. Um, I, I really like to get as many people involved as possible. So if, if there's an opportunity for you all to come up and do something with us, um, let's see if we can make that happen. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's, you know, there's also the, the two hours of drive, which makes it a little bit challenging as well. But um, yeah, follow our Instagram. Um, you can find me, find my, um, my info on the Westminster page. Feel free to send me an email and just say, hey, I saw you say some things in an auditorium. I'm curious about Great Salt Lake stuff.